You are fewer than usual today. Fewer and fewer. Um, можно, наверное, начинать. So, hello again. Uh, and uh, we are uh, starting our lecture. Today is lecture six. And um, we are going back from uh, syntactical stylistic devices, which we discussed last time, uh, to lexical stylistic devices, or rather, not to stylistic devices, but to expressive means of language. And um, today we're going to look at the systems of um, lexical units, which function as um, stylistic systems, right? Well, you are familiar with this topic from your lexicology courses. You remember two chapters of uh, Olga Vasilina's wonderful book um, uh, were devoted to um, Stylist, to, to the stylistic layers of the English vocabulary. Today we're going to look at them again and refresh them uh, in our memory, but uh, more from the angle, from the point of view of stylistics. And uh, we'll see which words are associated with which functions and situations. Uh, well, as a starter, I wanted to show you this um, entry from Multitran Dictionary uh, to show you the abundance of different meanings and you see that the meanings are distributed um, across various spheres of usage of language. And this is precisely what um, uh, we deal with in stylistics. So apart from lexical units, we deal or from uh, stylistic devices, we also deal with expressive means of the language. And part of the expressive means of the language are the stylistic connotations of words, their stylistic coloring as we discussed in our first uh, lecture. Uh, um, I'm sure I'm giving you time, especially, to study the, difference, the different meanings of this word. And you see that there are really, really unexpected usages uh, and, and meanings of the word uh, cabbage, depending on who used them, when they use it, and in what, um, in what manner they use it. For example, military jargon, medical humorous, right? So it's uh, also sort of professionalism. Uh, then uh, rough and coarse usage, colloquial slang, uh, jargon of sowers, um, school slang, right? And um, it is interesting to study the system of all these things that we come across in, uh, in dictionaries, but also in our real life. So what is behind these usages? And in order to do that, um, we look at the term style and genre or register. Uh, well, you remember in our first lecture, we discussed the meanings of the word style. So now we're not going back to that. But um, uh, I wanted to introduce two more terms. One of them is register, which, use, which is still widely used, especially in English speaking literature, uh, in the English li literature. Um, scholarly papers, uh, which refers roughly to what we call style, uh, but not always. And there is a lot of criticism <clears throat> uh, behind this term. And um, roughly, it is the same. It is the functional situation of variety of the language that arise from variation in. And of course, if you look into specialist literature, you will see that there are different definitions to style. Some people argue it is not register. Some people argue that register is better than style. We're not going to go deep into that. What is enough for us is to know that there are such terms as style, register, and genre. Well, genre, of course, is narrower than style, right? But nevertheless, uh, all of these uh, are functional and situational varieties of the language that arise from variation in, th in several factors. Genre is more related to text rather than, than to the variety of language. But, of course, in non-rigid uh, word use, you can come across this term as well. So, uh, variation in what is important for style and register? Variation in mode or medium. This is the words that you use. 
Do you remember in our first lecture, there was a slide with a drop of paint added to pure water, right? And we said that a word which is colored stylistically is like a drop of paint added to pure water and coloring the whole of it. So depending on what words you use, you sound differently. Whether you use sublime words or low words, vulgarisms, archaisms, or slang. The second point is tenor, or uh, tenor, which refers to the status, like permanent status of people, uh, like um, an old man, right? Or not permanent, but um, for example, the uh, the son of some gentleman, right? Uh, the son or the father or the role of people. For example, you can be um, a student, a teacher, a daughter, um, an employee, a passerby, a pedestrian, uh, a client, a shopper, uh, a customer at a shop, at the, uh, in different in different situations, but it will be the same you. You will play different social roles. So depending on where you are, with whom you are, what your relations with relationships with these people are, you sound differently. You will speak differently to your three-year-old uh, daughter, and you will speak differently to a boss. And finally, the field or domain. Uh, and this is the subject matter of what you are speaking about, what in uh, what you are commun communicating about. Uh, so if you are, now we are in linguistics, but then uh, you can uh, go out and then you go to, to the shop uh, and you find yourself talking about food, about shopping, about clothes, then you go to... Um, you go to the theater and you talk with your friends about theater, about the roles, about the performance. Then you go to church and you, um, you know, read, um, uh, say prayers, and then you sound differently. So, uh, or for example, if you are talking to a friend, you can talk about I don't know carrots and recipe of a soup, or you can speak about philosophy and Kant and uh, I don't know uh, Hegel and uh, Leo Tolstoy and other things, right? So, and then your vocab your vocab vocabulary is determined, or the, the way of your expression uh, depends on the subject matter. So, mode, tenor, and field. And these define the functional and situational varieties of the language, which we broadly call styles or registers. And here I wanted to give, uh, to give an example uh, of Violations. Why is it so important for us, not only as teachers of English, but also as speakers of English, um, as, as practical bilinguals, um, to know specifically uh, what we're talking about, uh, when we're talking, with, with who we're talking about, which words we're using. Look at this um, uh, fragment from uh, the film Educating Rita. Uh, have you seen it? No? Well, the context is like this. Uh, Дмитрий, можно готовить, выводить на слайд. The context uh, is like this. Um, uh, a working class lady uh, des decides to pursue uh, higher education. So she goes in for um, evening courses uh, to a university to uh, study literary criticism. And um, one day her tutor invites her over to his place to visit him uh, because he thinks she would benefit from that. And here we can clearly see, <clears throat> well, um, uh, this class distinction, uh, in a way. Not class, but uh, he is upper middle class, she is lower class, right? Working class. And uh, she's trying on different clothes, preparing to go to visit him. And she cannot, she's always unhappy about what she's put, she puts on. It doesn't match the image of the situation she's going to find herself in. And secondly, um, he says certain things, listen very carefully to what she is saying, and then tell me, why is she always unhappy about what she's practicing as small talk? She's trying to practice small talk. Tell me, what is wrong with what she says? What is the clue, Jade? Will you come? If you want. No. <laughs> what do you want? Yeah, all right, I'll come. Will you bring Denny? Well, I don't know if he'll come. Well, ask him. All right. Rise me, Custom. She's still under the dryer. She only wanted a demi wave. She'll come out looking like a friggin' muppet.
was at a house once where they served chocolate mints with their coffee. <laughs> My husband. Oh, he's an electrician, you know. The marvellous Chinese takeaway just at the end of our street, you know. You see Macbeth by William Shakespeare? This is a kind of uh, thank you. Um, right. So, what is wrong? Why is she always unhappy with what she's saying as practicing a small talk? That's a very subtle thing. Well, I'll repeat what she says. Uh, I went to a house once where they served chocolate mints for their coffee. What is wrong with saying this in the company of her, of her tutor and educated people? Like, uh, well, teachers. Chocolate mints clashes with what? It's not chocolate mints themselves. It's actually the triviality of what she's saying. She's this is about subject matter and domain. She's speaking about things that those people would probably not be speaking about so excitedly in with such surprise. They went to to house ones where they serve chocolate mints to their coffee, right? She sounds like a child who's speaking about some treatment, like grown-ups know about this. My husband, oh, he's an electrician, you know. What's wrong? The mode is right. The words are correct. The subject matter is bad because in the company of those teachers, oh, my husband is an electrician, you know, sort of um, makes people look at you like, um, well, He's not, he's an electrician. He's not um, a professor, right? Uh, sort of this sort of class uh, class thing, right? Uh, uh, probably we here, we are used to this equality of thing, you know, when people respect people no matter what their uh, occupation is. And moreover, working specialties are even more respected nowadays uh, than some others. But here it is felt. Or for example, have you, have you seen Macbeth by William Shakespeare? She doesn't need to clarify, of course, everybody knows. So that's the problem. It's not only how you say it, it's also what you say, in what situation you say, and who you say it to, right? So this distinction, these distinctions are really, really very subtle. And uh, now we go on and we, we look at the medium, the stylistic layers of vocabulary. So in a way, we're going over what you already know, but from a diff slightly different angle and maybe with new examples. Uh, and just to remind you this theory that there are broadly three main um, spheres of vocabulary, depending on their stylistic coloring. And this is the formal or literary layer, um, uh, which correlates with the formal situations where you find yourself not much at ease. So whenever you are in public with other people who are not very familiar to you. And moreover, the formal layer of vocabulary is more associated with the printed page. It's more mostly first and foremost <clears throat> used in writing of various sorts, various sorts, fiction, journalism, um, and newspapers, uh, official documents, things like that. Neutral, that's what everybody can use in any situation. Not, uh, well, uh, uh, no matter what class you belong to, what situation you're in, it's fine to use it anytime. It's like pure water. It will never do you bad, right? It will only do you good in any situation. And finally, <clears throat> informal or the colloquial layer broadly. Uh, the informal layer is associated with informal situations. Uh, it could be, most of all, it is oral communication. It can also be, uh, and very often it is used, in um, informal writing on the internet nowadays, or informal letters. And um, secondly, uh, well, yeah, it is associated with informal situations where you know people, or where you don't, you are not afraid of offending people or when you intend to offend other people, um, right? No matter how bad it, it might be. 
So formal, neutral and informal or literary and colloquial. And this is a good chart um, uh, based on Galperin's, Ilya Galperin's uh, subdivision of styles. In, well, in the middle, you have the whole scheme. On the left and on the right, I've enlarged the upper bubble on the left and the lower bubble on the right, right? Um, so neutral words, standard English vocabulary is in the middle. And it overlaps with special literary vocabulary, with literary vocabulary and overlaps with colloquial vocabulary. So the zones, which are called common literary vocabulary, are used by educated people and some not very uneducated people in oral communication as well, right? Um, and uh, common colloquial vocabulary is used also by most people uh, and even by the educated people as well. When they talk to each other, they're very much likely to use common colloquial vocabulary too. On the left, you see the special literary vocabulary, and you have terms. Terms are on the borderline between special vocabulary and common vocabulary, because lots of terms, as you remember from lexicology, migrate from specialist sphere to um, everyday use. Then we have foreignisms and barbarisms. These are foreign words uh, which are adopted into speech, and they're almost out of the vocabulary, but you will we'll see how they're used. Archaic, archaic and poetical words are on the way out from the, the vocabulary, but they're still retained in some spheres of uh, communication. And finally, nonce words. Nonce words, the words which are coined for the nonce, in Russian they're tr translated as occasionalisms, or occasionalisms, words which <clears throat> were created uh, for some particular situation, and they may die out immediately after they were used. They, they are single-use words. Or if people like them, they can go on and live on like new uh, ne neologisms and then enter the general vocabulary. On the special colloquial vocabulary side, we see professionalisms. And professionalisms are the mirror of terms. In what way? It is professional jargon, right? Uh, we'll look at it as well. Uh, then jargon of various groups, dialectal words, vulgarisms, and again, nonce words. Now let's start with formal, common and highly literary words. Common and highly literary words. Um, the easiest way to recognize highly literary, literary words is when we learn the language and we don't understand them. But you don't know these words. So most words that you don't know after school are common or highly literary words uh, after B1, right? Uh, and uh, common literary words can also be used for stylistic purposes. They can be used for um, uh, to, to show, for example, um, uh, the perception of a child. This is an extract from a book called Super Fudge. Uh, about a small boy, uh, a, uh, a small kid of three or five, I forget, and the way he, well, just about his life. And there are several conversations where he doesn't understand the words. And uh, this is easy to see how these um, literary words come into practice. You lie when you make up commercials. Uh, his father is a copywriter. Fudge asked. No, but we sometimes exaggerate, Dad said. What exaggerate? Fudge asked. We embellish to make our point, Dad said. What's, em what's embellish? Sometimes Dad has to stretch the truth, I explained, and the narrator is his 10-year-old uh, brother or 14-year-old brother. Thank you, Peter, Dad said. That's a very good way of putting it. So exaggerate, privilege, embellish means right? So these are very good examples of common literary words, which grown-up people in England know all of them. It depends on whether they use them or not, but then um, anyone else for cocoa and animal crackers? Do you know what animal crackers are? Biscuits in this, in the, yeah, crackers in the shape of animals. Mum asked, getting out her favorite chair and yawning. Me, I called. Make it unanimous, Dad said. What's unanimous? Fudge asked. 
It's when everyone agrees, I explained. Everyone agrees, Fudge repeated. That's nice. I like it when everyone agrees. Right? The unanimous, well, unanimous may be considered a common literary word. It can be considered an official, uh, officialese word. Uh, but uh, still, the mechanism here is the same, right? And it's mostly associated with literature of various sorts. Uh, now, at this place, uh, I wanted to show you one more episode. Dmitry, can you prepare, please, that same fragment from the same place, the beginning? Thank you. And uh, this is the next scene is when um, Rita comes to her husband Danny, and he is uh, he's also working. He's a worker, common worker. And since she started, she, she had already started her education, she had acquired some words which are typical of um, educated people. And look at his reaction to this. And you will see how much depends on the style. Older shot. Three, south end, two. Eight, one, Wrexham, one. Are you going to change your mind? No. Just what would you do? I'm going to the pub with your mum and dad. That's where you should be going. Oh, well, we're not good enough for you now, are we? Millwall, two. Mansfield, two. Port Vale, one. Crystal he invited three. us both. Come on, change your mind. Come with me. You might actually like him. Oh, might I actually, Susan? Well, isn't that actually, actually nice? Well, sod you. Um, so you see, even the word actually, which I think you are most used to, sounds like, or looks like, in this case, function like this red, uh, red rag for a bull, right? He, he feels that this is a marker of another style, you see? Not the one he's used to. Uh, and this is a common literary word, actually. Right. Now let's look at some highly literary words. These words are already uh, known to people who read literature. Uh, very often, educated people uh, understand these words. It doesn't necessarily mean that they use them, uh, although sometimes they do. Well, let's first look at. Um, oh, of course, they use them in writing. Uh, sometimes in conversation, but more rarely so. So look at let's look at the words that you uh, whether you recognize them or not. Solitude, eh? Solitude, одиночество, приятное одиночество. Sentiment, чувство, sentiment. Serendipity, no, no. Serenity is uh, tranquility, eh? Sincerity, serendipity, I think serendipity, no, it's the ability to understand something very clearly. Проницательность, uh, felicity, happiness, and tranquility, you all know this word? Тишина, спокойствие, serenity, безмятежность, right, fascination, очарование, fastidiousness. Привередливость, facetiousness, шутливость, delusion. You know this. Elusive, ускользающий. Right, so do you recognize the value of these words, right? They, they, they denote, um, diff, well, complex, complicated concepts usually. And that's their value. They give uh, us an opportunity to speak not only about basic things, but about abstract things, about philosophy, about, I don't know, relationships and many other things. And actually, I remember, um, I, I have a very good example to give you of how these words uh, work, even that people, educated people, do use them in their um, conversations, orally. Uh, it was in Nottingham, a friend of mine who's a teacher at uh, university, uh, was speaking to his graduate student in my presence. I was just doing something, reading, and he was speaking to his graduate student, and he said, you should make it more succinct, speaking about her work. What is succinct? Concise, short, lapidary, uh, right, yeah? Uh, dry, 
six things. So he used it. He used it in every in in his well, everyday conversation because speaking to students is an everyday conversation. But he used it orally, so that shows you that highly literary words can also be used orally, not only in uh, on printed page. In which? In common conversation. Oh, of course, of course, but it all depends on the level of your conversation, what you are talking. Also, don't don't forget, it depends on the domain what you are talking about. If you are speaking about, I don't know, shopping at Pitorichka and then you use, you use the word succinct, I don't know in which context you would use that, but that would sound out of place, you see? Uh, but if you are speaking about, I don't know, your diploma, your uh, final project, of course, of course. Um, and this is a, just an extract from Oscar Wilde, the, the Rose and the Nightingale. And the marvelous rose became crimson, like the rose of the in eastern sky. Crimson was the girdle of petals. Girdle apayasenia. Is lipestkov. Do you know the word petal? Right? And, and crimson, crimson as a ruby was the heart. Right? So mostly highly literary words are used in literature, in fiction. You'll find lots of them there. And in order to understand fiction, in order to read the um, the literature in the original, we need to learn more and more of these words. But it's not only literature. It's also used in highbrow newspapers, like The Guardian and The Telegraph. If you, you, if you want to read English press uh, with, uh, I don't know, uh, well, regularly, if you want to get news from there, you have to pick up these words as well. For example, the impetus for ESA to urgently chart it, blah, blah, blah. What is impetus? Impulse very well. And chart? Right? Uh, we offer not a pledge, but a risk request. What is pledge? Promise. Abishanya, right? So these are words which could be uh, considered really, really literary and bookish words. Well, if we go uh, deeper and deeper into the formal vocabulary, we'll come to poetic words, which are just one step away from lit highly literary words. The more literary, the more archaic, so to speak. Uh, and um, if we go very back in time, we'll see words which really, in essence, are Middle English words, which come to us back from Middle English, but which are even still retained by poets if they want to write especially about sublime things, elevated things, high things. For example, alas means we right? Thou and thee mean, remember your history of English, you and you, you, thine, and thine, your right. I and nay, yes and no. Well, I, apart from being poetic, it's also an archaism, it's also a dialectism, and it's, in a way, it's also a jargonism, because, for example, in the army, how would you say, yes, sir? I, I, sir, right. Um, doth is the equivalent of does, uh, then they like also different um, abbreviations like never, near, near, over, right? Never over, things like that. Then some special words like harken, prislušice, woe, grief, steed, a horse, jeribes, and and some others. Uh, well, here I've marked the poetic words: a beautiful, awful summer day. What hast thou given? What taken away? What hast thou given? Have you given? On the road of life, one milestone more, one milestone more. In the book of life, one leaf turned, or we have to pronounce it as or in order to make it rhyme. What immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? This is from the from Tiger by William Blake. So and still poets use that if they want to make their poetry sublime. Now, archaisms. Um, all poet, most poetisms are archaic, but not all archaic words are poetisms. So basically, poetisms are part of archaic words which are retained, which are retained in poetry. Same as much of the dialectal material is also archaic. 
but it is still used in dialects by people who use them sometimes in everyday conversation. But in standard English, that may also be considered as archaism. Well, uh, some the words which you remember, the words which are no longer used, and some of them are no longer recognized by speakers, na native speakers. Uh, the twi but nevertheless, many of them are retained in classical literature, such as Shakespeare, for example. So uh, in his day, they were not so far from him, right? N not as archaic as they are for us, but still. Uh, betwixt Swain as a peasant, habit as a dress. This is a very good example. You are used to the word habit as privichka, but if you read, uh, well, Shakespeare, if you read other, even other um, authors, you will see that habit is sometimes used in the meaning of clothes. I prithee, I ask you, methinks, I think, forsooth, really, brethren, brothers. Uh, archaisms are still in living use uh, in church, in prayers. So, um, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So, we have archaic vocabulary and archaic grammar. And the same actually is true for Russian. If we read the, the um, uh, prayer, Otche Nash, we still have this Otche fossilized, right? Do you address your dad's papas as ocha? Well, you can if you want to do that ironically, right? If you or, or jokingly, but um, in everyday speech we don't use it. However, when it when it comes to religion, uh, we read it fully seriously, right? Ocha nation, who art in heaven, thy kingdom come. So it is still uh, they still live in uh, some restricted areas of the language. Uh, sometimes this religious use can be spilled over in everyday uh, usage. For example, there's love thy neighbor, Sarah Moss, and the darker side of community in a crisis. Love thy neighbor means right? So you can see that in newspapers, in order to understand this, you need to uh, know some of archaisms too. Um, then, archaisms are widely used in historical novels, of course. And when generally you read novels about the past, you cannot do without archaisms and historisms. I didn't single out historisms here as a special feature, but you remember, historisms are things which denote objects which, the objects which are no longer in use, not the word, right? Like, uh, uh, meč, uh, uh, meč, bayarin, uh, christianin, things like that. Uh, well, this is from Black Arrow by Stevenson. Nay, Master Shelton, said Hatch at last. Nay, but what said I? We shall all go. And there lieth poor John Carter, crying poor sinner for the priest. Dick gave ear. Lieth he there, he asked. I, in the second porter's chamber. Let's translate it. Nay, Master Shelton. Nyet, Master Shelton. Nay, but what said I? We shall all go. Right. Uh, and there lieth poor John Carter, crying poor, crying poor sinner for the priest. John Carter, Dick gave ear. Прислушался, да, прислушался. Uh, lieth he there? Он там лежит, он спросил. I, in the second porter's chamber. Да, в, uh, в камере, в помещении второго прибратника. Uh, then, but look, archaisms are also making a comeback to everyday speech. First, ironically. And secondly, also to show your education. But also ironically. Uh, look at this. My parents' generation, methinks, largely failed to see the value in life without money. Right? Methinks can be either ironic or just a sign or trying to show off, I think. It's kind of a wine bar for royals, for sooth. Do you remember what for sooth means? Really, really, right? And this is ironic here. Uh, well, uh, a parallel would be in Russian. Ibo zaisim kasaimo. These are words which are beloved by students nowadays, but 
please believe that you, they used to be archaisms 10 years ago. People would recognize them in, as outdated words, wouldn't use them. Nowadays, things like ibanefik, they are everywhere, right? And students do like the word ibo, um, and also kasayama and zasim. So they are making a comeback. First, ironically, and then seriously. Now, terms and names. Terms and names. Terms and names. Well, you remember, the terms are words which are specific, uh, which are uh, typical of um, some specific area of communication, uh, usually some professional jargon, right? Um, uh, this is what we call English for specific, for special purposes, right? The language of law, the language of medicine, the language of physics. Uh, so we mostly associate terms with uh, scientific areas. Uh, and many of them are. If you look at these terms, you can easily say uh, what the sphere of communication is. Labelization, phonetics, linguistics, sulfate, chemistry, whatever it means, right? Uh, Stegosaurus, paleontology, right? Biology, megabyte, IT. So uh, what are the capabilities of terms in, term, uh, in terms of, I'm sorry for the pun, unintended pun, uh, in terms of uh, their stylistic value? Terms are bright, uh, because they bring into your narration or into your communication, again, very specific things and broaden your mind. And uh, they are an opportunity for you to show off, right? To see how, to show how much you know. Uh, and at the same time, they serve the brevity, the exactness of communication. And in, um, of course, in uh, clock uh, in, in literature, they can be used to create the atmosphere of a certain sphere of a certain. Okay. I'm punning all the time today to create the atmosphere of a certain sphere. Right. Um, and not necessarily uh, science. You know, that there are lots of different occupations, some of them as low, I would say, I'm, I'm saying this in quotes, as low as some hobbies. Uh, but they have their own terminology, actually many hobbies being ancient pursuits like sewing and knitting. Look at this. Do you know all of these words? Probably not. Well, I don't know some of them myself. Uh, like, uh, well, do you know the word bobbin? Katushka. Katushka, bobbin, right? Stitch. Stizhok. Cross stitch. Krestik, right? We should write krestik. Patchwork. Patchwork, так у нас и называется, right? Лоскутное шитье. Thank you for providing the proper Russian <laughs> equivalent. Uh, I don't know what tatting is, maybe you know. Unpick, right? When you unpick something with a needle. needle. Uh, the eye, ушка, right? Uh, so these can be considered terms as well, right? Even though they're related to a specific area. Well, many other spheres like uh, stamp collecting, I don't know, coin collecting, beekeeping, all of these pursuits have their own terminology. And these can be used, of course, by the authors uh, to create vivid pictures. Oops. Um, uh, my uh, animation went wrong, I think. Um, come on. Okay, never mind. Behind the this picture, you see the picture of Rhoda Dent. I just wanted to ask you what these things are. Because, uh, well, uh, among terms, we often classify names as well, but they are not terms. There is there is such a thing as nomenclature. You haven't studied that in your lexicology, but this is one more field of uh, language. These are different, all sorts of names, right? Uh, well, onomastics, but no, nomenclature is different. That's about the types of and specific names of individual kinds of things, species and things like that. And they can also be quite picturesque because they bring specificity 
into your uh, some specific colors into your uh, speech, like rhododendron. You see the you don't see the picture of it behind the this main picture. In this bright green picture, you see erythroxylum cocci. Uh, what do you think it is? Yeah, <laughs> well, you can say it, yes. That's the plant which produces cocaine and coca, <laughs> right? Co cocaine. And I think Coca-Cola as well, if I'm uh, not mistaken. I may be mistaken. You should double check me. Uh, Magnolia Cambelli, I didn't, mm, I didn't uh, put the, uh, the picture onto the slide, but you can find it yourself. It's one, a type of flower. Or rhinoceros beetle. Yeah, don't you think he's a cutie, right? And uh, yeah, it's a very interesting one. And this is the stylistic potential of terms and names. They can create vivid images. They can serve to create beautiful metaphors. Uh, for example, um, this is an uh, this this is my third pun for today. For a bad one. Uh, for example, this is an example from uh, The Guardian or from The Telegraph newspaper, um, which is about problems in the NHS, National Health Service in the UK. Uh, the president of the Royal College of Emergency Medicine has called hospitals lobster traps, easy for the frail to get into, hard to get out of. Frail yeah, weak and ill and fragile. So um, uh, the hospitals, it's easy for them to get into, but very, very hard to get out of. He called it a lobster trap. You see a picture of a lobster trap here with a narrow entrance, and, well, with a, with a wide entrance and narrowing down in, inside. And then you cannot get out, right? Because it is difficult for the lobster to find the way out this small, narrow uh, exit, exit, right? Um, and this term of lobster fishing provided this interesting metaphor, very um, spot, it's very spot on, very exact, right? It creates this metaphor, but it's a term. Uh, never trust labor, raising taxes isn't their DNA, right? This DNA is a term which is already in common usage. But this creates a beautiful metaphor, right? And and a hyperbole of um, labor um, of the Labour Party uh, adapt at and uh, in favor of raising taxes. Uh, actually, this example is is from the Telegraph, and the Telegraph is a conservative newspaper, so it criticizes labor. Uh, terms can also be used in various jokes, and you know about this. Uh, like a scientist asks his wife at dinner to pass the, um, I forget the English, sodium chloride, something like this, natri chlor. And what is this? Salt, right? Um, this is a cartoon, again, from the Telegraph, which describes the state of, tell me what. Look at the uh, note. Western economy. But here it is styled as the name of a plant, right? Like this one, something like Magdolia Cambelli. And here it is, economy Westernia, right? And the tree loses, is, is, is losing its last leaves. And this cartoon was published in autumn, so it makes it even more interesting. Now, from terms, it is an, a short step to uh, officialese. You remember officialese, uh, the language of official documents. It is not a pure uh, stylistic marker uh, because it is. it comes from two sources, literary words and sometimes highly literary words and from terms. That's why I placed it not after literary words, but after terms. And this is what is used by official documents um, in order to make uh, the text formal, right? In order to make it, um, uh, sometimes in order to make it 
what's the word? Um, the word policy, no, uh, monosemantic, right? Uh, if you want to, it to be understood in only one way, that's why uh, they use all these uh, cumbersome structures, constructions, but they also use these uh, words, cliches, formulae of politeness, uh, and finally, legal terminology. And of course, very often and most times, they overdo it. So uh, small print is notorious for its lack of transparency and clarity. It's very difficult for ordinary people to use this, to, to, to read this officially, let alone speak it. Um, and uh, as um, your textbook in lexicology says, officially is, is better avoided in everyday conversation because it makes it sound formal. Although, of course, you cannot do without officials. That's what we need when, if you want to fill in the visa form, if we want to, um, well, to fill in any form, really, and to read any official document, if you want to, to function in, a, in our society, we need this. Uh, well, uh, are there any words here which are not familiar to you? Plenty potentially representative. Um, I second the motion. I support the suggestion very well. I support the suggestion. I second the motion very well. Um, well, the resulting text would look like this. In witness whereof we have caused this diploma to be signed and our corporate seal to be here to affixed. Uh, so all sorts of wheels and things like that are written with um, officialese, uh, well, legal terminology. Um, it can also be used in fiction to create this uh, smell of officialese. Um, uh, well, this is translated as свидетельство чего или там свидетельство коего. Мы э, подписали этот диплом и приложили к нему нашу корпоративную печать. Well, still in, um, in passive. Uh, <coughs> oh, bigger texts look like this. This is taken from the website of the World, World Medical Association. And this is the WMA resolution on academic sanctions or boycotts. So just look at this... Um, example, real, real example of a document and see whether you can read it. Um, it is a difficult one, uh, but it is, uh, as I said, monosemantic uh, and not monosemantic, that's the wrong word, but it's, it, it tries to be exact and clear. Uh, therefore, be it resolved that the WMA regards the application of such restrictions as arbitrary political decisions designed to deny international scholarly exchange and to blacklist particular physicians or bodies of physicians because of their nationality or because of the political policies of their governments. And this is all preceded by five clauses, right? Whereas, blah, 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 whereas, blah, 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 and so on. So this is officialese. Um, sometimes uh, such style, such style, uh, this style, such a style, is mocked in fiction. This is an example from Terry Pratchett, um, a humor, uh, well, a humorous story. Uh, Dorcas leads the tri a tribe of gnomes, gnome. So they are small people who live in the basement of a huge mall, shopping mall, and they have a thing which uh, is always silent. They were told by their forefathers to always carry it with them. And one day it starts speaking. And it speaks clearly in officialese. It wants to warn them that the uh, supermarket is going to be demolished soon. But it does so in such words that they cannot understand it at first. I have urgent information to impart to the leaders of this community. Are you aware that you're living in a constructed entity with a limited life? Fascinating, said Dorcas. All those words. You could imagine you could almost understand what it's saying. 
<laughs> right? I think it it describes our emotions when we read some official lease. I, re I remember it when I read some official papers. All those words, Tietislava, you could all, almost imagine that you can understand them. Now, barbarisms. Barbarisms are foreign words which are recognizably uh, foreign, but they're used uh, in literature, they're used in everyday speech by educated people, of course. Uh, or they're used by foreigners, right? They can be, they're, they're used by foreigners. Do you remember this um, famous video with uh, a Russian speaker in the United States who, yeah, shape and size, right? So this is how far foreignisms and barbarisms begin. Right? If you haven't seen it, watch it. It's, it's, it's worth seeing. Um, uh, so these words are also borrowed into the language. Well, English, for understandable reasons, has a lot of words from French. And people use them to show off, of course, to show that they are educated. Uh, such words as en route, on the way, for Putti, bon mot, a good phrase, a witty saying, a witty saying, an aphorism, en passant, in passing, he mentioned en passant. Au fait, he uh, well to, to know something well, to be knowledgeable in something. He's au fait with computers. Au fait. Actually, if you want to get more of those, I advise you to find um, innovations, uh, the advanced level. You know, this um, series of student books, student books, innovations. Well, if you don't know, they, we have them in, in our library here. So uh, it is innovations, the red one, advanced. Is, this is le unit 16, I think. They have quite a lot of them there, very useful ones. So if you want, you can uh, enlarge in, in your vocabulary with that one. Uh, so, noted in an earlier biography is another bon mot, which Voltaire probably did say, right? That's how it is used in, uh, in writing. But also, foreigns, foreignisms and barbarisms are used to create local color if you write about foreign lands. The little boy, too, we observed, had a famous appetite and consumed schinken and braten and kartoffeln and crab cranberry jam. Right? Uh, we immediately know that they are in Germany, right? So these are the unassimilated foreign words taken uh, into, into the text uh, to create some color. Sometimes they're used jokingly as well, especially the understandable words. This is um, uh, user's commentary under uh, an article on the, on the Guardian about Aldi and, li Aldi and Little, Little. These are two um, low-budget supermarket chains in the UK, and originally coming from Germany. Uh, it's something like Pitorichke and Magnit, and about the different things associated with them. But this is one of the readers who writes, Danke, little, Aldi and Little, for being the much-needed disruption, and blah, 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 right? Sometimes they write Spasibo, things like that, if they are speaking about Russia. Um, now, informal vocabulary, informal vocabulary. Um, well, you remember about common colloquial words, right? Colloquialism, these are the words which are used in colloquial conversation. Below them, substandard, are vulgarisms, vulgarisms. So these are the words which are used by uneducated people and especially rude words, pejorative words. And we also have slang. Slang is a very broad term. It is understood differently by uh, different, si different scholars. But we have, uh, like, if we summarize much of that, we can come to the conclusion that there is general slang, which um, is connected with specialist slang, teen slang, professional slang, and social groups slang, which are not professional. So by age, by profession, and by other roles, in society. What is the relationship between common colloquial words and general slang? Very often, it is difficult to tell them apart, especially familiar colloquial and slang words. They must be familiar, familiarmen. That means that they imply uh, good, uh, very close relationships. However, if you use these words with, with unknown people or with, uh, poorly, with people who you don't know well, um, that sounds familiar, 
right? It often shows lack of respect, lack of education, um, and uh, general slang is close to familiar colloquial, but it also is a, has a huge potential for express for expression because it is make slang is expressive. It must create a picture, right? It must create a picture. Uh, yeah, we'll speak about that when we come to that. Common and special colloquial. Um, well, uh, uh, he, I'm giving you here uh, more like familiar colloquial words. Uh, he's some doctor. He's an awesome doctor. Very good doctor, right? Um, uh, don't be all day about it. Don't take too much time. To tuck in, uplitaits, uminaits. Right? She was she was surprised to see her tucking hardly. Where did she put all that? Right? Oi. Um, oi. Okay, we will skip it. Um, vulgarisms and pejoratives. Well, I'm not going to devote too much time to that for understandable reasons. But uh, it, uh, the word vulgarism encompasses not only rude words, it encompasses also the intentional uh, or uh, unawares use of uh, grammatically wrong thing, wrong words, right, or wrong grammar. You the best, seriously, instead of you are the best. Do you remember mother to son, where she used I's been climbing, right? So grammar mistakes which uh, native speakers make their vulgarisms, right? And they're used in songs, for example. Uh, well, you pro you've probably heard a lot of that in songs, right? Uh, but usually in those songs, which aim to create the atmosphere of trash, the atmosphere of uh, lack of education, the atmosphere of macho guys who are not educated but who are tough, something like that. Um, me no money, me no come. Savvy? How do you translate this? Не будет денег, я не приду. Смекаешь? Усек. Right? Oh, in Russian. Тебя хотят за генерала отдавать, а ты ж что придумываешь? Right? So this is vulgarism. Uh, ain't. Uh, actually, ain't is a good word to remember because, um, well, it's, it's associated with various um, uneducated groups of people. But sometimes they have, they have catch, well, they... It, it is part of catchphrases, really useful catchphrases. Look at this. You ain't seen nothing yet. What does it mean? You ain't seen nothing yet. So more is coming, is to come. And my favorite, I, I use it in Russian too. That's, you know, uh, common sense, very wise, very, a very wise phrase. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Если это не сломано, не надо это чинить. I will, there is only one, two gentlemen in this room, right? But uh, if you ever fix anything, remember, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, gotcha. Got you. Got you. Попался. Um, this is from the Sun newspaper back in um, in the years when there was the Falklands War. Gotcha. Papalsia, our lads sink gunboat and whole cruiser. Наши парни потопили канонерку и придырявили крейсер. Right? So if you want to get more of informal vulgarisms, uh, common colloquial vocabulary, you can read lowbrow newspapers like The Sun, The Daily Mail, uh, The Mirror. They are fond of this. And sometimes these uh, colloquialisms and uh, vulgarisms are used again to create, well, they're used for humor, like this one, uh, the caricature of the economy of the United Kingdom, under which there is a huge hole. And there is a worker who is invited to fill in the hole, and he says, Oh, you're looking at 50 billion plus to fill that, governor. How do you translate that? Mm -hmm. Довольно. Mm 
начальник. Начальник, that's right. Вам, да, вам придется затратить больше 50 миллиардов, чтобы это засыпать, да, чтобы это починить. Начальник. Right, so this uh, form of address, also sort of a vulgarism, right, a familiar colloquial, is used here for this beautiful metaphor. Well, and of course, low colloquial are the words which you should avoid. That's why we have very few examples here. But they're, they're sort of markers of this, uh, like hell. If you use hell, this is low colloquial. This is something you don't use with, with if you're educated. I mean, of course, ed it's the same as with Russian uh, swear words, you know? Even academicians sometimes use swear words, but that is sort of anomalous, or it is done very, very rarely, right? Uh, same with this. Avoid words with hell, with uh, these words like bloody, lousy. And I, I, de I deleted one, I had one more phrase from, from fiction with the word nigger, which nowadays is, is a no-no too. Although, well, yeah, because negro, I think negro is fine in, in Russian, although not, not, not any longer in the United States or England or the UK. But nigger is definitely a no-no. Yes. Uh huh. Oh, if it has a strong eye, it is forbidden. Uh huh. It may be ironic, right? And uh, self-deprecating, right? Well, right, thank you. So, lots of nuances. I agree. Lots of nuances. Now, slang. Um, you remember the slang comes from various sources, and this is this the, the this flower is not complete. You can add more and more petals: um, army, underworld, navy, and merchant marine, immigrants, hobos and tramps, railroad workers, baseball players, show business workers, high school students, college students, financial district employees, jazz musicians and fans, narcotic addicts, and more and more of them. Right? This, uh, from these special, special groups come various words which fill uh, this slang, um, slang niche. Uh, an example. Uh, well, since we're in stylistics, uh, I wanted to, to show how, that slang indeed is a very picturesque, picturesque um, layer of vocabulary. So it is, uh, it provides uh, expressive means to the utterance by itself, like synonyms and antonyms. Um, for example, this is trucker's slang or CB slang from the United States. Now, tell me, guess, who is Miss Piggy? And she is also Mama Bear. Miss Piggy is more, is ruder. Mama Bear is less rude. Tr who are truckers? Delnaboyshiki, right. So, who do you think is Miss Piggy and Mama Bear? A female police officer. And this is uh, Miss Piggy from the Muppets show, a popular show. Um, a bulldog. A bulldog is a truck which, has, which, which is uh, made by Mac, and its brand features a bulldog. Yeah. Uh, well, Miss Piggy for, for the female ones. I, I'm not sure for what is there for the male. Uh, yeah, do you, you know? Oh, wait, 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 wait. It's incredibly ironic for me to just explain this kind of offensive terms, but still. Uh, mostly in British football fans culture, uh, they call most of the policemen, most of the people in the police departments just pigs. So Miss Piggy is just, yeah, the type of female police officers. So yeah, all the policemen are called pigs in just their language. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea. I think that maybe answers your question, because although this is trucker slang, but it might be connected with that general f football fan slang as well. So going on with Bulldog. Bulldog is a type of, of truck. Well, which is of Mac made uh, make and it features a bulldog and moreover it looks like a bulldog a bit don't you think with the jaws uh, pr protruding jaws uh, 
And tell me, what is grandma laying? The, not the left, the, the right, the right lane, right, the right lane, the slowest lane on the, on the road, right? You are grandma lane. So you see, uh, they're all uh, either metaphor, metaphoric or metonymic or otherwise picturesque words. Uh, well, we'll skip this one and well, uh, just adding slang words to uh, your utterance makes it um, uh, picturesque. But we must remember the warning from Olga Vesivna's textbook. Avoid using slang unless you're writing uh, a piece of fiction, uh, because you are highly unlikely to find yourself in a station where you can organically use slang. You must be within these groups uh, to be able to pass as cool people who use slang words. Uh, because you know if you if you are if you use slang words in an uncool way, this is uncool. Right? Uh, well cartoons also feature slang. Pub grub served daily. Chuck was nervous about trying the grub. What does grub mean? What does this pub grub serve daily? What does it mean? Grub is havchik, yuda, jratva, right? So pub grub and grub, but on the other hand, grub means lichinka. So Chuck didn't know the word grub in the slang, meaning it only knew, he only knew the neutral meaning of the word slang, of the word grub, which is lichinka. And he was uneasy about trying the grub. Dialectisms. Well, dialectisms can be used in uh, writing in order, and they usually use uh, with graphon to show how the dialect features uh, work. Um, they're used usually for local color, to reflect local color, and uh, also to characterize the characters. This is my fourth pun today. There is something going on. To characterize the characters. And now, uh, Dmitri, можно вас попросить включить тот, который пирамидку? Well, look at this. This is the same film. Uh, Rita first arrives at university. This is what she says. А можно развернуть тоже ее на, на весь? Спасибо. Одну секунду. So she, she uses, um, her, well, she speaks with a dialect accent and also with this working class accent. And look at the effect. Можно включать. Come in. For God's sake, come in. I'm coming in, Anna. It's that stupid bleeding handle on the door. You want to get it fixed? Uh, yes, yes, I, I, I meant to. Well, that's no good, is it? Always meaning to. You want to get on with it because one of these days you'll be shouting, come in, and it'll go on forever because the poor sod on the other side won't be able to get in and you won't be able to get out. And you are? What the police say? I'm a <laughs> Right. So, um, the stream of dialect, right, and, and working class English is uh, very, well, sort of characterizes her as a personality as well. Very impulsive, but uh, pure-hearted, on the other hand. Um, nonce words. Uh, nonce words, both in the literary layer and in the uh, informal layer, uh, are the words which are created for the nonce. Occasionalisms, occasionalism. They're often uh, created by writers in order to strike the reader. This is a famous um, nonsense, um, nonsense uh, poem by Lewis Carroll called Jabberwocky um, and uh, in from Alice in Wonderland. It is all made up of nonsense words, right? But not, not only nonsense words, but also nonce words created for the nonce. It was brillic and the slithy toves did gyre or gyre and gimble in the wave. All mimsy were the border groves and the mome wraths outgrave. The Russian translation did a Brilliant job as well. Varkalis, Klivki, Shorki, Perialis, Panavia, Ikurkatalis, Luki, Kak, Mumziki, Vnavia, Vmavia. None of these words exist, right? 
and um, this is just for for uh, the nonsense style of literature. However, nonsense words can be purely and well very well understandable, uh, and they are spot on. But they are rarely, or well, sometimes then they don't find a way outside the, this particular text. She objected to George because he was George. It was, as it were, his essential Georgeness that offended her. I didn't buy the piano to be sonatoed out of my house. There was a balcony full of gentlemen. So he's not just talented, he's genius. We must reform Europe. We must rethink Europe. I love you matcha, plenty matcha, me too. Um, after all, they are, they are our honorable representatives from the halls of Congress. Don't you think this is brilliant? Representative thieves. And uh, next, uh, phrase, uh, next sentence is, before Joe Biden be became president, it was from, the, from a newspaper, Joe Biden, the Democrat Party vice presidential candidate, thinks patriotism should be spelled patriotism. I find this brilliant too. Uh, now, if we go on and we think about a total mixture of styles, of restyling things, uh, we can see that, for example, uh, well, lots of different uh, spoofs and parodies. Well, this is an example of parody, a parody song to the vacuum cleaner. Um, there was this genre of odes in the Middle Ages to sing something, some virtue or something, or some object. And here, modern content is written, is described in Middle English terms. Hava cum clenere, singeth his song, a lufsun lie hit is Iwen, with breathing is amorous and strong, though thu makes mone a morning longe, till all me hus is clene, a serpente is the luvile neke, the body is a little bulle. Can you translate it? Hava cum clenere, singeth his song. Hi, vacuum cleaner, sing your song. I will not translate the second line, I forget it. With breathings amorous and strong, dikhaniemi lubovnimi i silnimi, thou makest, you make many mornings long, ty delaš mnogi mai utra dlinnimi, till all my house, till all my house is clean. A serpent is thy lovely neck. Твоя прекрасная шея – это змей. The body is a little bulle. Твое тело – это маленький бычок. Right? Now, uh, it can, can be vice versa. This is a rap rewriting, I think it is rap, rewriting of uh, Rome, Romeo and Juliet in rapper's slang. Are you one of Romeo's boys? Yeah, that my peeps. Do you have a problem with that? Romeo, don't sweat him, man. I got your back. Romeo, you little punk, I'm gonna kill you. Chill, Tybalt. You don't even know me. I've got better things to do than fight. Right? <laughs> okay. Well, uh, it can also be used even more um, uh, intricately. For example, this was, this was a long time ago. Uh, there was some comment it was an article about Russia, about Russian politics. And there was some uh, comment which favored Russians. And then comes uh, one um, commenter, uh, commenter who, below the newspaper, uh, newspaper article. Uh, and he tries to mock this person, to say that he is a troll, that he is, or that he is not English, that he's not American, that he's actually Russian. Hello, I am average of American citizen and definitely not Russian. I have never have heard glorious President Putin, but he is sounding like strong leader, like Bear. Donald Trump, J. President elect, will also be strong leader. Obama is make excuse for Hillary of Clinton, who is weak like watery borscht, which I do not eat because I am definitely not Russian. Right? <laughs> this is trolling, of course, right? I will say it in the microphone. как второй лектор. А несколько лет назад была просто очень схожая тенденция, когда очень много таких вот уже 
согнанных троллей со стороны Китая было отправлено в русский интернет, и очень много было сообщений, каких-то сайтов и комментариев, которые начали высмеивать по типу «Я обычный рабочий Иван, город Тверь, а моя уважать великий коммунистический партия Китай и союзный ПУ». Как-то так. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and, uh, yeah, the, the, such things exist, but in this case, it is an American who is trying to troll Russians uh, as if they are American and they, well, and uh, express their views. Uh, well, Bathos is the last thing that I'm going to speak about. I have just one minute. I have enough. That's enough for what I have. Bathos is a stylistic device of combining elevated and low styles, high and low notions with resulting incongruity, incongruity, insatiety, often causing laughter. Do you remember from that extra from theater? I love him, I love him, I love him. Presently he blew his nose, right? Я вот так люблю, люблю, он высморкался, right? This is Bathos. Uh, well, uh, the, uh, let's read the last one. The ballerina rose gracefully on point and extended one slender leg behind her like a dog at a fire hydrant. Балерина поднялась на пуантах и грациозно подняла ногу, как собака возле водоколонки. Right? This is um, this bathos. Он был в вас в Лондоне, в Константинополе, в Тетюшах, в Казани. Uh, actually, I actually I visited Titusha. That's a nice place, but of course, this that's not Constantinople or London. Каким восторгом светит твои глаза? Какое неподдельное счастье выражает их лица, когда на столе появляется бутылочка? Это была без привлечения тяжелая трагедия, сравнимая с трагедией Гамлета или Короля Лира. Неожиданно проиграла ответственный матч их любимая команда. Right, so this is Bathos. It's similar to anticlimax. Remember, we discussed such things. Well, uh, and that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. Можно выключить.